So you're a big jujitsu fan, Joe. Yeah, you could say that. Are you a Joe Rogan fan and listen to the, all, all the people yeah. on there? I don't listen to all of his stuff, but I've listened to some of his like clips. The podcasts are super long. <laughs> I, I, I like to listen to audiobooks, you know, sci-fi stuff maybe, mainly. So no long-form conversations in general? Uh, typically, no. How'd you get into jiu-jitsu? I was doing uh, full contact karate uh, called World Oyama. I got my black belt in Shotokan back in 99, then, and then I always liked martial arts. So I started doing full contact karate back in 2015. And that was only three days a week, and I wanted to go another day. So I was listening to uh, the biography of George St. Pierre, the, the, the UFC champ, GSP. And he was talking about how he comes down from Canada, goes down to New York back in the day to learn jujitsu from Hanzo Gracie. And I'm like, man, this guy's coming all the way from another country to learn this stuff. And there's Charles Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, which is Hanzo's older brother, down the street from me. Why don't I just go check it out? In San Jose? No, this is in San Mateo. In San Mateo? Yeah. Oh. So I started going there one day a week, but the full contact stuff, the full contact karate was kind of harsh on my body. At that time, I was 45, and I was going against these kids, and it's pretty harsh on, like, your fingers, your ribs, you know, your toes. So jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is still a full contact martial art, but you're, there's no striking. And then you're basically... No tapped. striking on your head or your face or all this other stuff you there's, see. There's no, no striking. There's no kicking, nothing. But wrestling and... Yeah, it's, oh. it's like submission wrestling. So you're trying to get the other person to tap by, you know, manipulating their limbs or, you know, cutting off the <laughs> blood to their head. Right, like whatever they call that, <laughs> that whole... Choke. Yeah, yeah. choke hold. Right. So then, then I stopped doing uh, the karate and started doing jujitsu. And then I just got completely hooked on it because it's so much fun. So now do you do contact? No, it's, I mean, jujitsu is still full contact, but there's no strike. No striking or yeah. kicking. Right. So I still do, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu six days a week. Wow. Yeah, I love it. It's like wrestling practice. Yeah. That's hard. Wrestling is super hard. Oh, I used to wrestle. It's super hard. Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. It, yeah. It's this, crazy. This is okay. easier than wrestling. Is it? Yeah. It's easier than wrestling because in, in wrestling, you can't let your back hit the floor. You lose your... Yeah, you're your done. Pinned. Yeah. In Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you could actually work off your back. Oh, that's true because you're yeah. really just looking for submission. Right. So it's fine, you know. For an older guy like me, I'll just be like, all right. How long do you get, do this every <laughs> day? Uh, classes are usually an hour or 90 minutes. It's one or the other. And you do it five days a week? I do six days. Six days? Yeah. The six days, and I try and go to yoga seven days a week just to counteract because jujitsu there's a lot of contraction, and the yoga is the expansion, so it keeps me uh limber, so to speak. So, do you take all these practices and apply them to pay per click advertising? <laughs> Actually, you wouldn't believe how much entrepreneurial and how much problem solving comes from being just physically exhausted and just mental thoughts come flowing and uh it's kind of like a meditation imagine doing meditation like 13 times a week uh and some of these solutions that have been haunting me for a long time they come to me either i'm walking out of the jiu-jitsu academy or you know going through the the final meditation of the yoga whatever it is all of a sudden i'm like oh my god yeah that's what i need to do Sort of well, I totally agree. I do all that on my bike. And when you, you um, ride, you know, you do 50 miles. I call it, Joe, I don't know. You, you described it as meditation. I call it giving your mind a break. Yeah. And basically taking yourself to a limit that you force your focus. Your body's basically forced on survival. Right. If you get your heart rate up there. And then it just releases everything else. Yeah, it's like like the no mind state, right? Yeah, just, Bruce Lee. I mean, yeah. he, I mean it, that, that's why he's there, right there. I mean, he's all, he's everywhere for me. I mean, it, it, his his whole philosophy of everything, Joe. I think the one quote that I always think of is is absorb what is useful, discard what is not. 
right. add what is uniquely your own. And any entrepreneur, anything you do right. is basically that. I mean, there's nothing completely invented. Right. It's very, I think, I don't know. I hesitate to say that, but wouldn't you agree? Like to get something just so novel and so new and so that you didn't take some ideas and combine them into yours is very hard. Yeah, it's things that are a mashup. And you can come up with some amazing stuff when you mash things up, you know, and they could be completely unrelated. That's some of my highest successes have come from areas where I've taken various things and I've mashed them together. And it's like, oh, okay, here's something that it doesn't exist. And if it did, it would be amazing. And yeah, I could, I could mash these five things together and come up with it. So, yeah. So I think that really, that whole philosophy, and it's interesting that you do the jujitsu and you do the yoga. And we were talking before we started rolling here that you actually came here from Iran or, and you, you didn't just come here. You basically escaped from Iran in what, 19, what, 1983? 83, yeah. 83, I mean, that's, um, that was a crazy time. Yeah, well, we, we, we um, left Iran on a visitor's visa and then went to Germany, got a visa there to come to the U.S. And then once we got here, we applied to... Uh... Just for listeners, we have a crazy dog running around our studio right now. Hey! Here we go. Hi, let's go. That's what happens when you have a, a studio in your backyard. <laughs> so you came here in 1983 on a visitor's visa. Do you think that they were, do you think that they were aware of what you were doing? Who knows? You know, um, we had a lot of money in Iran and we couldn't bring any of it. And so my mom, my sister, and I, we only had the $700 on us for kind of the visit. And we had documentation that we have a house there, we have bank accounts there, we have everything there. And we didn't bring any of it out of the country. We just left everything and came with 700 bucks, the three of us. And then you did what? Like, where did you land? Well, we... Uh, my or aunt, where were you visiting? <laughs> yeah, my, my aunt was living in Santa Clara. And we came here and at the age of 14, I had to go and do like dishwashing at like a Persian restaurant for three bucks an hour cash. So I could um, help my mom pay the rent, you know, stuff like that. So I went from a very comfortable life to a revolution, to a life of like physical labor <laughs> at the age of 14. Did you but, even speak English? No. We, I mean, we, we in Iran, we had uh, English classes in our school before the revolution. But you don't really learn to speak. You just learn some really, really basic he, she, it, you know, that kind of stuff. So you land, you, did you fly into San Jose or San, San SFO? You yeah. find an SFO and mm -hmm. was it like a whole new world? Yeah, I remember uh, when we came here, my uh, uncle, my, my aunt's husband picked us up and took us to Togo's. And I remember that like it was yesterday because he ordered the number nine hot pastrami family size. And <laughs> my eyes were about to pop out of my head. I was like, what the heck is this? And uh, it was an amazing experience just to have that amazing sandwich at the time. Um, and I was just like, this is a different place. <laughs> it was a, a, flying into SFO, even in, I think in 1983, was definitely a different place than yeah. what, where you came from. The, so you, you come here, you work in a Persian restaurant to sort of make ends meet, but in many ways, it was sort of lucky that you came to Silicon Valley. I mean, 1983 was the beginning. I mean, it was, there was things here happening in the seventies for sure when, yeah. um, throughout the seventies. But when we start to get into the eighties in 1983, that's. Apple computer is rolling by 1983. Steve's still there. Um, circuit boards are being built. Chips are being built. Silicon Valley is being defined at that moment. Yeah. I mean, I remember in, um, I think it was in junior high school or even high school maybe, but they had that little old, the first level, the first uh, versions of Apple computers that we were using even then. Uh, that's what I learned on and all throughout college I was using Apple and then when I got to university I was using Apple 
when I left, I had to use PC and I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know, I had to uh, yeah. And everything all new again. PCs are, I grew up on Apple too. Well, I actually had a Commodore. I had a VIC 20. You remember that? No. I had a VIC 20 and a Commodore 64. And then I think I got a Mac. But in many ways, you're sort of lucky in the sense that of all the places in America that you could come, you came to this place. I am lucky. That, you know, technology. So what do you do? You you work in the restaurant. Do you join an American, obviously, school here? Yeah. I mean, I went to Peterson Junior High School, right? Right in Santa Clara. How'd you learn English? Just going through ESL classes. <laughs> it was tough. It was. I mean, I remember even clearly as long, uh, even when I was a senior in high school, I couldn't speak it fluently. It took a while. It took four or five years to really be able to communicate effectively. And, and uh, in college, I had a. I was fortunate enough to have a girlfriend who spoke. Who was very. Uh, her English was very well, and she would just correct all my papers and be really tough. And and so I I really picked up on my English uh, when I was in junior college. Was there a lot of per? Was there a Persian community here? In did a lot of. I know that down in Southern California, there's a, a large community, but. Was there also a lot of people during that revolution coming up to Northern California? Yeah, yeah. not not quite as many as Southern Cal, but the Northern Cal crowd are more the engineering crowd. There and you think they just Cal. knew that this area was prone to that or? Um, I don't know if it's because of that or because they just came here, went to school and then became engineers, you know. But because of the jobs. Yeah. You get a lot more business people and up here you get a lot more tech people. So you go to school here, and then what's your first job? So my first job out of college was uh, at a company called Novella State. We, we made uh, semiconductor equipment for wafer manufacturing. I was working as an industrial technology guy there. I was working in manufacturing engineering. And uh, the salespeople there were selling these uh, features that the machines didn't perform. And I was the guy that this would, and the, the, the customers would call the product managers. The product managers would be like, oh, I don't know what this function, it doesn't exist. So they would kick it up to R&D. And I was the liaison between R&D and the customer because they didn't want to give the R&D people directly to the customers that would just eat them up. So I would be like, hey, this functionality doesn't exist. So let me go talk to the salesperson. I would go talk to, go to the, the sales building and it would be empty. I'm like, where's everybody? I'm like, oh, they uh, have all uh, gone to Hawaii on President's Club because they hit their quotas. I was like, oh, on the wrong side of the table here. I need to be in sales. So I went back to school, got my MBA, and got a job at Oracle as a sales rep. Oh, that's a, like that is, in many ways, the pith like the highest place to learn sales, isn't it? I mean, Oracle yeah. is historically, yeah. even to this day in enterprise sales, yeah. extremely tough. But you see a lot of CEOs, even in today, got their cut their teeth as right. salespeople at Oracle. Yeah. I mean, they put you through a lot of training. I remember uh, because every training you take, you know the retail price of it because it's in, you know, they make sure you know about it. And I was like, doing the math and it's like hey i have the equivalent of another master's degree price in sales training you know because it was like thirty thousand at the time in the, in the, in the year 2000 it was like 30 grand worth of sales training so uh, they didn't pay much but they did train you was it tough oracle was really tough it was all metrics driven i mean i was inside sales at the time so it was all very metrics driven you had to make a minimum number of calls every day. So you were on doing that. Sit. So even back then they were doing this 50 calls a day, set three meetings, the whole, like it's it, on a big floor. Yeah. And then everybody's numbers would be posted every week. And then the people at the bottom, they would find their, you know, they would find their way out the door. Right. <laughs> right. That's crazy. But yeah. that, but that's really where you learn to keep asking, isn't it? Yeah. I learned a lot at Oracle and sales training works. It works a lot. In fact, 
when I got the sales job at Oracle, I had been working in other jobs where I did sales, but in the low tech, car stereo company, this and that. And when I was interviewing, I'm like, I can totally sell on this and that. And then it was eight months in, and I was like, man, I don't know how to sell at all. <laughs> and finally, like it took me eight, nine months to figure out, all right, this is what you have to do. So, um, what did you learn? Like, what, what do you remember what the, I don't want to, it's not a trick, but what's the no, technique I, that works? Well, what happens is typically salespeople, they, they ask somebody something and whatever answer they get, it's like PhD dissertation on the solution. Right. And people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear about your solution. They want to hear about their own problems. They want to be able to quantify the problem. Right. They want it. So they want to be able to do the math and the implication of the problem. How much is that problem? Do I have a problem? How much is the cost of this problem for me? And then do I have anything I can do about it? And if the answer is no, then, oh my God, what can I do? Do you have anything that would work? Then that's when you come up with the solution and you pitch your pitch. If you pitch your pitch too early, then you will lose their interest right away. So one of the classes that stuck in my mind was the spin the spin selling class, which is, stands for situation, implication, uh, situation, problem, implication, and then need solution. So asking the questions. And typically these days, and even back then, you don't really want to ask a bunch of situational questions unless you've done your homework up front. Do all of the homework that you can learn up front, and then when you get the person, you have to ask really intelligent questions the answers to which aren't obvious on from the website and the documentation outside of the company. And then they'll be like, oh, this guy's done his homework. He's earned my time. I will pay attention to this conversation. And then you can help him figure out the situation, the problem, the implications. And then when they explicitly say, oh my God, I solve this right away. What can I do? Then you come up with the solution. Well, here I have a question for you because there's a lot of people cutting their teeth on LinkedIn, apparently. I say apparently because I'm sure your inbox is full of people pitching you these things. And they lead with, I'd love to get 15 minutes on your schedule, Brandon, and learn about your business. Right. And the first thing I say is, why would I educate you about my business so that you can make up something to pitch me? So when you're saying, I, I mean... It's ridiculous. You would never answer to that. No, I do answer though. I answer these long things back that basically take their time and they usually cut me off. But because it's so ridiculous that that's the lead in pitch versus I think what you're saying is do the research, talk about that person's business and get them, this is my words, but you can correct, get them invested or earn their trust by trying to offer something, whether you get it wrong, doesn't matter as much as you, they can tell you've spent time in their business. Is that right. it? Earn the right to talk to them by doing your homework as much as possible up front. In a way, um, one of the things that I think about is you've seen in the nature channel, you've seen the, the bird come in and chew the food and put it down the throat of the, 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 the baby birds, the chicks. Um, a lot of times what I think about is, all right, let's say I'm talking to Brandon. What, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? I'm trying to get him to say, yeah, I'm interested. Send me something. That something that I'm going to send you, I'm going to summarize that and just feed it to you, spoon feed it to you and say, if I were to send you something and you were to read it, after reading 20 pages, this is what you would find. And here it is right now. Let me just spare you the agony. And just provide real value that is earning you their time. And that, that value has to be real. It cannot just be made up canned. A lot of these um, LinkedIn messages or the hundreds of emails that we get, they're just even bot driven. They're not even... There isn't anybody, like if I see, hey, Joe, if I see somebody saying, hey, on a tag, I'm already, I don't even have to see who it is or whatever it is.
Well, how do you lead in then? So how do you, because these are, um, so let's go back to Oracle. You're on the floor. You've got to make these cold calls. Right. So do you call up and say, hey, Joe, I was reading about sales X. It sounds like you do X, Y, Z. What do I say next? Well, let, let's, uh, so Oracle is like, 23 years ago. But okay, so let's use your current. I was having a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the person had six different campaigns running. They were generating leads for their salespeople, and this was a VP of marketing. And they were running six different campaigns. Uh, not to interrupt, but is this enterprise sales or B2C? N no, these are uh, B2B. Okay, B2B. Yeah, these these were B2B. Um, and um, we did an audit on their account and we found that there's like they were not calculating cost per closed lead they were just calculating cost per lead and the cost per leads they all looked kind of equal but then we saw that they had the data in back fed back from their uh, crm back into the google ads where you could actually figure out the cost per closed lead and we figured out that out of these five sections, one section, the cost per closed lead was like eight grand. And the other sections, the cost per closed leads were anywhere from 15 to 20 grand. So we figured out that the section where the cost per closed lead was eight grand, and these are cost per leads are of like 300 bucks. And so the cost per lead doesn't sound outrageous, but the cost per closed lead is high. We figured out that these, um, the, uh, this campaign that has the cost per closed lead that's less than half of all the other campaigns, their impression shares, meaning how many times their ads are shown versus how many times um, people search for their services, is only about 15%. So they had a chance to really bring in all the leads, take put all the budget towards that campaign bring in all the leads for that campaign where the cost per closed deal is half the price of all the other campaigns and uh so their um overall they could have done with nine hundred thousand dollars what cost them 1.5 million right so because the the we did a four-month period the audit that spent 1.5 million and then that for that 1.5 million, when we took it and translated it, and what would it have what would have happened if you had done it this way? It would have been 900,000 for the same number of deals. So that's 600,000 out of 1.5 million that they could save just by using this strategy. So if I'm going to reach out to a VP of marketing, I would say, how would you like to cut 40% off of your cost per closed lead? We just did a campaign where for 900,000 we did what had happened for 1.5 million previously and that's something like hey i want to you know i want i want that for, you know whatever oh i see what you're saying so you you once you are able to show that by curiosity going back to the were they using some script in that or was it just the targeting of the pay per click that was getting that segment of the market meaning was that $8000 close done by a salesperson yeah who was had done their homework, so to speak, like we talked about, or yeah. So you're talking about the close rates, right? Right. Like, why... I'm going. I'm going back to the close rate, Joe, because I want to know how to get that magic to use for myself and and listeners. Probably are also thinking how what 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 is that difference? Right. Well, so the close rates come down to the diversity of kind of types of leads that we're coming in. Maybe if all of your leads are coming in this area, your your salespeople can become more proficient. Maybe you could do more sales training for that area and increase your close rates. But if you're scattering the salespeople across all these various areas, they're having good uh, results with this one type of lead. And they're not having good results with the other types of leads. Why is that? You know, how can you increase those conversion rates, so to speak? Uh, yeah, what I'm um, trying to understand is the conversation of the salesperson. So going back to this, 
you know, the, the LinkedIn person hits you up with this. What story did the $8,000 salesperson tell versus this 15,000? Was it just the lead or like, was it, were all the salespeople using the same story or was the $8,000 person right. using this? They had done their homework. They knew that the, they knew more about the company um, because I find that what I think is hard in cold sales what, with the marketing driving those leads is that initial conversation. Right. Going back to what you said, earning the trust to talk. Right. How do you actually earn the trust to talk? Well, these are inbound leads. So when okay. You, yeah. When you have an inbound lead, the person's explicitly said, yeah, yes, I call when I have a chat. How about the outbound? Yeah. Like, can we go back to that so that we could get some of your magic on <laughs> on how do you get that initial conversation? I, you know, I, I haven't, I get pitched for podcast people. Right. The ones that I listen to, I had somebody today, one of the things that pet peeve for me, and I understand podcast agents are really pitching a lot of people because they need to get on show their clients on shows right but we put a lot of effort into a show right so i don't want to be treated i you know i want you to listen i want them or whoever's pitching to listen to the show right so this person today clearly had listened to three episodes like i know the ones who really listen and the ones who just talk right and I'm usually lost in the beginning of the pitch because it's all about what they, they don't take the right perspective, meaning what is the person going to offer the listener? Right. I under, we all understand that getting on any social media is going to give you publicity and a link right. worth money, probably right. More inbound links if you're, however you're doing it. But they, the ones that are successful seem, or at least that I answer, seem to pitch that they show that they listen to the show mm. and then they try to craft a message. And, and the one that I read today in between recording, they got it completely wrong, but I'm still willing to write back and say, hey, you did your work. So is that really what you have to do on a cold? Yeah, actually, it's what you bring up is a, it's a, it's the argument of intent versus technique. If your intent is to help the other person succeed, then people can forgive you the technique if you have missteps. But if your intent is to fill your pockets, get the link, get the publicity, get rich, whatever it is, then people, it's kind of almost a, um, instinctively will know that there's something wrong. Even if you're the smoothest talker on the planet, they're still not going to go for it. So, um, that, that's a, I, I like, I never, I, I haven't heard, maybe I've heard it in a different version, but it's, it's, it's a good way to put it. And maybe it's just like helping other people. If you're genuinely going to help another person, they'll forgive. I think what you're saying is the salesy, whatever pitch you're going to give because you generally want to help that person. Or, or even if you get it a little bit wrong. So right. I, I read a book back in 2004 by, uh, by a guy. It's actually, uh, it was like in McKenzie or one of these, like Ernest and Young, one of these consultants, uh, white guy, American, that had gone to India and spent like 15 years out there and he changed his name to Mahan Khalsa. And he wrote this book called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. And I, I read that book, listened to the audio back in 2004, and that's where this came from, this intent versus technique, which is let's get real, let's not play. If I'm going to ask you to get real, let me, you know, that means I need to know what is it that's making you tick. Well, you what makes you tick is providing value for your listeners. Okay, you're already a pretty successful guy. You don't need anything for yourself. But you're trying to give back. You're trying to show some great you know, graciousness for for your successes by giving back to the community. And so, if if I'm going to come on the show and have a chat with you, then I need to have clear contributions to your listeners, and that needs to be my intent. 
anything that happens after that, that's just gravy, right? That's just the icing on the cake. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's what they miss all the time. They want to pitch the solution. I, I, I don't, I, I, I can, I mean, and this isn't just me. Like, I, I don't, our show is, you know, it has 400 and some episodes and it's pretty popular, but it's not Joe Rogan, but it's a good show. So I'm just saying that to caveat, not to be arrogant about it, but I can get guests. Right. I, I, I mean, I, we can, we all live in here in the Valley. Like you, you can dig something up. People are generally friendly here if you right. ask. Um, so I think they mistake that and, and, and switching that we're using the podcast situation as an example, but I think that applies to every product. Right. The, 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 to answer your question that you asked earlier, which is what makes the salesperson with the $8,000 cost per close lead versus 15,000. The thing is, if those were outbound calls and that person had some sort of a, oh, you have to make a hundred calls a day type thing over their head, then they couldn't succeed. Those things are in conflict with each other. So you're better off making 10 really quality calls, right? Even if it, even if it means prepping for a call, maybe sending some stuff ahead of time, but why would anybody want to talk to a salesperson? I mean, if you think about it, there are only two. I hate, I don't mean, I don't hate the person. I just hate the game. Like solve a problem. I guess it's too trans. I think it's what you said. It's that they're, they just want to give you a, they're so desperate for that solution, for that sale, that they can't generally be interested in the person. Well, there are two reasons why a senior executive would want to talk to a salesperson. One is if that's if they think they're going to learn something from that salesperson that they can't figure out on their own. And two is if they think they're going to learn something that salesperson has something to teach them that they can't learn from the people that work for them. And so if, if I can't learn it on my own, and if I can't learn it from people that work for me, then I want to know what that salesperson has to, salesperson has to say. And a lot of times that comes from information about other companies in your environment, other companies in your market, right? So in this case, uh, the, the firm, their product is not unique. There are other companies that do the same thing as they do. So if, if I were a salesperson, I, I would want to reach out to those competitor VP of marketing and would say, look, this is something that we did for this company. We could do the same thing for you. We saved 40% off of their cost per closed lead. As your cost per closed leads, you know, 40% lower than, you know, this is what theirs was. How much was yours without you know breaking any confidential confidentiality agreements? But and that is your sales pitch. Yeah, but we actually don't. My company is called SalesX, but we don't actually do any sales. We well, I, sales I, I, I was going <laughs> to say we got off on this sales discussion, and you don't do really sales. You do you don't do sales in that way at all. You do pay per click advertising and help yeah. people make money, but. Um, you do have experiences. So you have no salespeople for your company? No, we've never had a sales department. How do you get sales? Really marketing. <laughs> How do you get sales? We get inbound interest. So either referrals from our existing customers or people reading some of the kind of the um, thought leadership stuff that uh, we write or our board members write. And then we can see who are these people and then track that back to SalesX and reach out to us. Um, our most recent, we, we recently had a, a quant fund reach out to us, just had a conversation with them a couple of days ago and I asked them, how did you hear about us? And they said, oh, you, you won the U.S. search awards for, uh, best use of data and best agency. So that goes noticed. So I'm like, oh, okay. So there's some of that, like we're, we're, we win these awards and, and people find out about it and reach out to us, but we don't actually have any salespeople, no. Well, I guess crazy, but it's actually probably good. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the thing is, I don't really like managing people. <laughs> so I've never been interested in scaling SalesX to make it this huge company. 
we're about 10 people, 10, 11 people, and uh, it's okay for me. Um, I don't micromanage anybody. It's just we have everything programmed to show up on KPI dashboards. We're looking at all of our clients' KPIs simultaneously. And if things go south, they change color. So they go from green to yellow, and we're like, oh, it's like whack-a-mole. Like, hey, what's going on there? Let's get that fixed. And if, if it gets really bad, it goes from yellow to red, then it's like all hands on deck. But the reason why we're called SalesX is that I, I, when I left corporate back in end of 2009, I started SalesX in 2010. I wanted to be a sales consulting company. I wanted to help people set up their CRM, set up their pitch, set up their brochures, whatever they need, get their sales teams going and help them grow sales. And uh, the first half a dozen clients that needed more sales, they all had really poor websites. So I'm like, oh, you guys need websites. So then I'm like, okay, I'm an engineer. I can figure out how to do their websites. I learned WordPress and I did their website. Then they needed SEO. So I'm like, oh, okay, I can figure out how to do SEO. And Google has this document, the uh, Google Search Engine Optimization Starter Guide. And so I'm like, okay, I'll learn how to do that. And I started doing that. Then they needed PPC because SEO, you can't beat the incumbents that have been doing SEO for a long time. And so I said, great, I'll learn how to do PPC and start doing that. And all of that happened in the first couple of years. The first year it went from sales X to being a digital advertising shop. And then um, we ended up hiring a guy that was a Google AdWords evangelist for 10 years. And he was still the only ever Google AdWords evangelist a guy named Frederick Valles. And uh, we had these like 30 accounts that were all part of a franchise, but the different locations. And we were doing PPC for them. And we had to do the same thing 30 times, but for different locations. So I brought Frederick in to bring some automation to SalesX. He used to be the, uh, one of a handful of guys that could write Google ad scripts. And uh, then after six months, he ended, we ended up buying his company and making them our CTO. And that's when we started building our own technology at SalesX to basically uh, better manage Google ads like in sophisticated ways. So you made a comment that I just want to go back to. You said you can't beat the incumbents on organic SEO. Do you believe that? Um, I guess so. I mean, SEO has changed But isn't that depressing for people who are listening right now who are trying to rank higher in SEO? I mean, it, why do you say that? Well, SEO has changed a lot. Oh, right? for sure. I mean, this is, we're talking 2012. Um, versus 2022, so 10 years has passed. Back in those days, and for the people that we want, we were representing, which which were this, this company is called Home Instead Senior Care, they were a senior care agency. Um, their competitors didn't do any SEO, huh. right? So now we were making geo pages, we're making sure they got all the title tags, the description tags, the H1s, all of the images, you know, were correctly named and all the different basic SEO stuff, and that was good enough. And we were making geo pages for them. Like, hey, your territory is these 17 cities, let's make, you know, senior care city name, home care senior, you know, city name. Block and tackle SEO. All that stuff, work your fingers to the bone type stuff. <laughs> and so back then it was working. And uh, nowadays, God knows what it takes. <laughs> and to do SEO, uh, Google loves the money from PPC. You're seeing basically most, like you might see one or two SEO links at the bottom after you see all the ads and then the maps, right? And the, I want to talk about that. The candy box, you know, for the maps. By the time you get to the bottom, you see a couple of SEO links, then there's like four more ads in the bottom, so. Don't you think Google's going to have to change that or it's just going to become a totally paid search engine and eventually that's ripe for disruption? For a company to actually come in and I'm surprised it hasn't happened. And the reason I say that, Joe, is because when I started my first internet company in 1996, there was a lot of search engine that emerged with, with unique search technology. Towards the end, it got 
I think Yahoo was using Microsoft and Yahoo had its own search. I think that was Tim, Tim uh, Yodel, Google. I don't forget his name, who was the CEO of Yahoo for a while, but it changed, I think, after he left. And I always wondered why. But if Google doesn't change that, then do people trust it less? Well, every time we search Google, we're not searching for products or services, right? We're also searching for a lot of information. And for that stuff, there are typically not either no ads. Or oh, no paid ads. Paid That's a good ads, point, yeah. too. So if you're looking for a product or service, then the ads, you know, of, of course, the ads are becoming because the way Google's algorithm works with the with the quality score requirements, the ads are becoming more relevant to you over time. So if you click on the ad, there's a likelihood that it's actually going to help you. But you're not searching for products and services all the time. You might search 10%, 20% of the time for products and services. The rest of the time, you're just searching for information and those things, they don't have ads associated with them. Most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time. The, the, but where that, I guess, the, like you said, where everyone is congregating around is these product and services. And even paid per click is changing in the sense that now you used to only have it on the right hand side for a long time. I don't know how many years now they used to put one or two at the top. Then you right. put it at the bottom. Now there's four at the top, sometimes four at right. the bottom. Then there's like you said, maps, then there's answers to questions. Right. Then there's videos from YouTube. Right. Then there's podcasts. Sometimes I've seen podcasts put in the top now. I don't know where that'll go over the, the right. years, but they clearly want people in their own ecosystem at YouTube. And it just becomes this big ad. I feel like I'm reading the newspapers back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's a whole conversation about Google's motivations and how they're achieving this because what they're achieving is actually, um, really good for Google shareholders. Oh, it's incredible. I'm a shareholder. Like they're printing money. Yeah. They've been printing money for a long time. I'm not, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's that you're right. That's a different discussion. There's a discussion here about making money. And then there's a discussion about what's good for the consumer ultimately. And then there's the discussion about what we as business owners do right. to get ourselves to get that attention, to get that click, to get that, right. whatever it is. Right. It's, um, it's going to come down for people that are doing Google advertising. They're doing pay-per-click advertising in order to stay competitive. They need to be able to track the lead all the way to the end. Full life cycle. Full life cycle and then feed the result back into the Google ad system. And so what happens is whenever you buy a click from Google, when you see an ad, you click on it. Somebody bought that click. Somebody bought your click. Okay. When they when somebody clicks on something in Google, there's a Google click ID that's attached to that. That that's a unique identifier for that click. To do effective Google pay per click advertising, that click ID needs to be passed through to the lead and needs to be carried across to the, the CRM of that buyer. And then it needs to continue to go down the CRM and see if the, uh, there was a closed deal from that click. And then if there was, that needs to go back into the Google Ads platform. And then the agency needs to be able to say, oh, okay, let's see what that is. And they need to go back and see what was the search term that yielded. Can you get that now that still? Click. Yeah. On the paid for click, you On still can. Click, yeah. I haven't done Google AdWords in a long time. Yeah. So, and what a lot of people don't realize is that there are keywords that you use for targeting. And then there are search terms, which is what people type into Google, which those search terms, if they're, they have some sort of a matchup familiarity, uh, similarity with the, the keywords that you're targeting, then it triggers your ads. Okay. But to find out the search term and then figure out, oh, Okay, this one actually ended up with a closed deal. Well, what's our impression share for those clicks? Oh, we're only getting 5% of those clicks. All right. 
let's get 100% of them. Even if it costs $100 a click, that's still going to be the cheapest click we could buy because we know those yielded deals, closed deals. So people are just buying stuff without fully grasping whether that stuff is junk or not. They're just, they're, they're measuring the wrong thing. They're measuring too far up funnel in terms of um, the results they're gonna get. So they're, they're measuring, let's say cost per acquisition, cost per lead, right? Cost per click, uh, or they're measuring like how many clicks they got, how many impressions they got. All of that stuff is irrelevant to your results the kpi is like you can't deposit you know cost per clicks into your bank account you need to deposit sales results into your bank account so the way to go back tag that and then measure it figure out what the cause of those closed leads are and then go after that with uh, with gusto if you like i can give you an example of that so this company uh signed up with us and their average cost per click was seven dollars and their average cost per um lead right what well, uh cost per deal which is cost per closed lead was seven hundred dollars so um out of every hundred clicks they would get one deal after about six months, their average cost per click went from $7 to $23. But their average cost per closed lead went from $700 to $90 because the clicks became so targeted. There was just like hitting the bullseye every, every one out of every three times that they were able to actually close these deals at, at a, like a 30% close rate instead of one percent close rate so not everything is equal and if you're not measuring the right things then you get the google vacuum which is i alluded to that before the before the podcast and the google vacuum is when you open up your wallet wallet and google pops a vacuum cleaner on there takes all the money out and you're not getting the results so in order to avoid it you have to be able to measure the right things I'm over here laughing because I feel like there's a need for a company that I should probably build and not managing like you do that ecosystem, but even going out one level higher to something that I did at America Online that we call marketing analysis. And you are so right. Like I can think back to myself yeah. doing this. Uh, a few years ago, when I started to start uh, experiment, I didn't get back into Google pay per click, but I did with Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I remember our lady coming back and giving the results, and she's like, "Hey, we, um, you know, we're we're charging twelve dollars a click, or it's costing twelve dollars a click, or something." And we were actually doing a lead magnet. So put this in perspective: we're doing lead magnet free lead magnet to funnel to sequence to sale right that's effectively the the model and then low price medium price high price right there's a whole upsell process to right. to that that was the model in theory and i remember just the natural reaction saying oh we got to shut down you got to stop like because we went from two dollars to twelve dollars for some period of time and it's such the wrong and that's what i think and i hear a lot of companies marketing departments i'm not picking on them it's just a fact that they're reacting to that instead of modeling right marketing financials and i i think joe i took it for granted that i worked at america online in 2000 and I think it's 2002, 2003 time frame, 2000, 2004. Now it's probably, it was early, it was early 2000s. That was a long time ago. Yeah. 
and companies still, I just assume like, oh, well, everybody has a, we call it marketing analysis, we call it what, marketing financials, call it whatever you want. And I started asking, talking to people on the show and other people like, hey, who's running contribution margin for you? Hmm. Which contribution margin comes after you get what you just said, which is your full closed lead. Yeah. Then I can build a contribution margin right. to really understand how this is all going to flow. And contribution margin isn't even the whole story because we haven't taken GNA into effect yet. Right. And, and, and I was shocked by the answers that I was getting. Well, and I, well, we don't, well, we sort of do contribution margin. You don't sort of do contribution margin when right. you're in marketing. Like you either, you have to, you have to do it. Do you f see the same? It sounds like you've made, you in many ways are serving part of that function. There's a whole other part of analysis that has to be taken from their other advertising right. and marketing that they're, they're clearly not, if they're not doing it with you. Right at the vacuum, let's call it, then they're not doing it on direct mail, uh, TV, radio, or any, they're doing yeah. the same thing. Do you, do you think that's true? Do you find it, the same thing? It is. Uh, attribution is really difficult, right? And it's, it's not impossible, but you need to work hard at it. You need to work hard for a fixed period of time to nail it down. And there could be a lot of roadblocks hitting your way. And so, you need to overcome those. You need to have tenacity and overcome those roadblocks and keep working at it until you nail it down. And then once you nail it down, then you can hit the accelerator. You can really, really hit the accelerator. So until you've nailed that piece down, which is um, wh where are the profits coming from? You know, what are the profitable actions? Until you figure that out, if you're just measuring the wrong things, measuring all actions, for example, that's not the right thing to measure. So one of our clients, um, they have figured out, they have figured out their profitability by DMA, like the direct marketing area. And there are like um, 201 or 200 and something. There. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, there's over 200. It's like 200 and something direct marketing areas. And they're saying, look, for these DMAs, cost per lead of $12 is okay. For these other DMAs, cost per lead of $20 is okay. For these DMAs, cost per lead of $6 is max that we want to pay. And so we've had to program some stuff that's saying um, we have over 200 different KPIs depending on the DMA and we've created automation that's managing their $600,000 a month Google ad spend based on 200 different KPIs all in an automated way. Of course, we have people who have to oversee this stuff, but to do that manually, it would be impossible to do. But the credit goes to those guys that they've figured out their business to such fine degree that they can actually ask us for this level of detail and management of their account. Most people are like, well, I don't know. Let's see what we can do. And That's exactly know. what the marketers come back with when I say, hey, can you send me the spreadsheet? They're like, what spreadsheet? Right. I'm like, the spreadsheet of how many costs per click, what our targets are. And they, you know, I'm not, you can't do everything well. But if you only sell that, then you're selling the wrong thing. And you've built all these automations into that. I have a friend, I was thinking when you said that, Jay, I have a friend, he's incredible, he built a company from like zero to $150 million in four years. And wow. he, 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 if you, you talk to him, he's, I went to business school with him, I, I love him, and he, he's unequivocal about it. You want to know how to build a company, you got to have a decent product. Right. You do have to have a decent. Nobody can help you there. Right. Like, but, so, the, <laughs> yeah. so we just got to take that off the table. Right. Let's just agree that you got to have a decent, you don't even have to have the best product. Right. You just have to have a good product. Right. And he said, um, here's how the meetings go. Marketing, 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 product fulfillment, customer, customer success, marketing, 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 marketing. Like, because if you focus on marketing and you truly dive into your marketing, understand even down to DMA, even down. DMAs are probably the best way, I guess, better than cities even, but 
however you do that right at that point you're a money machine yeah you're not guessing no. these companies that that i find that are still trying to figure out i question like why haven't you modeled this or why haven't you built your financials in a way based on the product and the margins that you understand what you can spend right I mean, I am I crazy here, no. Joe? Or this this company that I just gave the example on, when they started with us about six years ago, they were like a thirty-five, thirty-six million dollar company. Now they're over four hundred million. Okay, their spend, their Google Ads budget, was about sixty grand back then, when they first started with us. Now it's six hundred grand. So they really, they're just, they're crushing it. Right, six hundred grand for a half a billion dollar company, that's a pretty, you know, pretty pretty good return on investment. And they track the close rates of these leads as well. It's not just the, the I mean the the way they figure out the KPIs is by tracking the close rates. Like they track so the their business model is that they send the product to the client and then they get the client's insurance information and then they get the refund from their insurance. So the, the client calls, they ship the product same day, get the insurance information, and automatically they get the money from insurance. But they figure out, okay, what are the the, uh, the reimbursement rates from these insurance companies? If these insurance companies, they give you 100% in three days, it's fully automatic. These insurance companies, they give you 80%, it takes a week, and somebody has to do stuff with it. So these have lower value than these so let's get maximized on these first and then if there's money left over go after these and then if there's money left over go after these and so on and that was the example that we started out with which is your impression share on those half price cost per close leads was at 15 percent. that means before you start hitting kind of diminishing marginal returns you can still get up to like 70 80 percent impression share so you're leaving all of that money on the table and you're going after these more expensive leads that aren't bringing you they're not yielding so that's that's and this is a startup environment as well so this is vc money that's being spent right so what do they say joe the vc money from all startups uh it used to say the valley but in general go to three people uh three people or maybe two people facebook instagram and uh, which are the same and google i mean who else do they go to i mean that that's and i and i as as you were talking i was putting myself in a listener's perspective yeah. thinking these two guys are acting like this is so I'm, we're not acting like it's revolutionary we're talking as it as if this isn't common that you would think that most people would do what this company that you're talking about does. But in fact, most companies, a lot of companies rare. do not. It's extremely rare. Yeah. And, and how can, so, so it's almost like people are flying by the seat of their pants. Kind of, because this stuff that we're talking about, kind of like PPC itself, it's not, the, it's not marketing and advertising. It's not that glamorous madman, you know, series. It's not, there's no, two martini lunches there's none of that stuff it's just super geeky spreadsheety just get in there and just crunch data all day long and marketing people they're not those people no and i think that's and that's what i mean by this marketing analysis i think that's the wrong word in today's world we used it back then uh it's not data it's not just data analytics because it involves financials yeah and and i don't know what the right word is be honest it's almost like we're inventing i call it marketing analysis mm. but you're right they in general and it's not a knock on market I'm, I'm a marketer you're a marketer it's not a knock on marketing people it's that the larger portion of marketing people are doing brand they're doing copy they're doing a b tests they're doing uh, i don't know uh images they're building banners they're building uh, video ads they're doing things like that they're not on the back end doing the financial stuff, which, like you said, is totally geeky. And most, yeah. you, 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 people, most people don't even think that's a marketer. Well, all of the stuff that you just named, each one of those things, they fall into activities that are required for 
to feed the top of the funnel, right? You need to have that stuff to feed the top of the funnel. But then the funnel is losing stuff along the way and you get stuff dripping down. You have tons of stuff going in from the top and you get stuff dripping down from the bottom. That stuff that's dripping down from the bottom, you need to spend just as much time on that stuff as you spend on all of the other stuff. But they don't. They hire all the front end marketing people first in all the companies yeah. that I've seen. Yeah. So, like I said, to do that, it's actually it's difficult to do. That's probably why. Right? Oh, it's super hard. It's, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, but but anything worth doing is is hard. Right. And you have to know how to. Sometimes you have to understand the right questions to ask. Yeah. Um. So let's unpack that because my next question to you was there's so many systems and i feel like i'm pretty good at integration and understanding software and all of that stuff how hard is it today let's just use an example i'm going to run google adwords we use hubspot right can i um dump my data from google ad adwords into HubSpot and 